Every now and again, you pick up a lens and it just fits. Size, weight, handling, build quality, industrial design. And on top of all that, you know, you know that this is precisely the field of view and maximum aperture you want. Irrespective of the lens, it takes a lot of time behind a camera, a lot of time behind different glass, a lot of shots to reach such a point of certainty. Then you take it out on its maiden voyage with intent. You arrive at your predetermined location, peer through the viewfinder, frame the shot, maybe fire off just another one or two as you hone the angle, composition, maybe a couple more to take advantage of a serendipitous moment of light, movement, or other manner of intrusion into the frame. And boom, you know down to your core you've got something. But it's when you first open the file at some later point or see the developed film on a light table and peer through a loop and can't help that involuntary gasp, perhaps a certain tightness in the chest, a feeling in your gut, a moment of giddiness or lightheadedness, maybe just a slowly spreading quiet smile, that you realize the totality of a single image taken through that glass so exceeds your expectations, even if you didn't get 100% of what you were after. An image irrespective of that possibility, where substance, art, technical brilliance, and gestalt, zeitgeist, and room to maneuver in post, combine in such a sublime way to you, no one else matters, that you realize something extraordinary has happened. It's not just that you've captured something that when you're done with it, you're going to hang on your wall. Hey, do you have any idea how much time and effort Ansel Adams spent in his darkroom dodging and burning Moonrise Hernandez, New Mexico, before he was satisfied with it? It's that you found a lens for the ages, the last lens of its kind you'll ever buy. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and welcome to episode one in a new, occasional, and highly idiosyncratic series I'm calling The Last Lens You'll Ever Buy. Idiosyncratic because while I may love the image I choose to share with you, the gear with which I've taken it and how I manipulated or didn't manipulate it in post, you may not like one, some, or all of these, and that's fine because, as I just said, that's not the point. The point is to share with you maybe motivate you or give you access to a way of thinking about your own transcendental photographic experiences. Or put differently, if you have never had one, offer a path to experiencing a richness in your photographic journey where you are at one with your gear, at one with the image you've created as a result, have the perspective and ability to live in that moment and revel in it. All of it. Today, it's this lens on this camera, Leica's Aposumicron SL 90mm f2 on Panasonic's Lumix S1R. And this image of Midtown Manhattan in the fog. Yeah, I love this capture. I love the way I can crop the crap out of it, push and pull it, and still be astonished by the detail. It's as if, actually, no, it's not as if, it is that this lens on this camera lets me see things that I otherwise would not, could not. And in seeing those things helps me understand just a little more clearly my environment. Actually, our environment. Appreciate just a little bit better how much labor, capital, creativity, hard work, blood, sweat, and tears works here. Go into the beating heart of a city. My city. And... In the interstice between that ambition of humanity realized as the New York skyline and the natural environment within which it exists in that moment, recognize and remember that I was touched by something bigger and more unknowable than I can put into words other than the totally inadequate awe and wonder. Now, returning a little closer to Earth, to be clear, cropping the crap out of an image is never my objective I have no compunctions about using this tool because that's all that cropping is, another tool. And I'm happy to do it in service of a final image. Henri Cartier-Bresson and Arnold Newman had no problem with it. I doubt Alfred Eisenstadt had a problem with it, so why would I? 
I always frame as best I can with the tools, vantage points, time and circumstances I have available to me in a given moment. And cropping, especially with this glass on this body, allows me to travel light, travel fast, and in the end, spend less time futzing and lugging and switching and twitching instead of thinking, imagining, acting, executing, savoring. I'm working right now with Whitewall to finalize the details before I order the very large print that will eventually find a place on the walls of our home. Okay. I can just imagine you asking, but why, Hugh, is the Apo Summicron SL90 F2 the last lens you'd ever need or want? Well, at least for this focal length, this is why. The Apo Summicron SL90 is compact, smaller than some full-frame 50mm primes, which means I can travel small. It feels incredible in hand, beautifully weighted, and visually matched when paired with either the S1R or my own personal APS-C Leica CL. These things matter greatly to me, as does the fact that, to my eye, it is beautiful to look at, right down to the stylized engraved 90 on the lens barrel. No protrusions, no buttons, no nothing, really. A case study in industrial design and minimalism. Its autofocus is fast and sure, if not silent, this last bit mattering not a jot to me, as I would only use it for photography, and for that purpose it is essentially noiseless, especially in New York City. Its minimum focusing distance of 60 centimeters gives me options, especially when mated to my crop sensor like a CL, from near macro performance to the full frame equivalent field of view and maximum aperture of my favorite portrait configuration, 135 millimeter f2.8. But beyond all that, beyond giving me a photograph I love, an image forever etched into my brain recreating a moment of transcendence, is that, again, to my eye, the micro contrast and most especially the resolving power of this lens actually outperform even the outstanding 47 megapixel sensor of that S1R. Is the Aposumicron's limit 100 megapixels, 200? I have no idea, but I suspect that in either case, it's sufficient to keep me happy for the rest of my life. So, yeah. That's why it is a lens so good, so suited to my particular needs, sensibilities, and ambitions that it will, for the rest of my life, inspire me to raise my game, a tool both talisman and extension of my artistic, intellectual, and emotional reach. There you go. A couple of points as we wrap up. First, I want to give a big shout out to my friends at B&H Photo for getting this fabulous lens to me at my request, and as always, having the patience to uh, let me take as long as I want to think through what it is I'm seeing. I want to give the same shout out to my friends at Panasonic USA for giving me the very same kindness and generosity with a loan of their S1R. What a combination. I want to acknowledge very clearly, yes, this is a $9,000 combination, equivalent to half a year's rent, say, maybe more, maybe less depending upon where you live, or some other more broadly conceived real-life, whole-life comparison. I want to be equally clear that you absolutely do not need to spend, and in future episodes I'll show you, anything remotely like that to have a transcendent experience or find the last lens you'll ever need. In fact, I recognize that for some of us, this kind of pricing simply precludes the very possibility, either by virtue of budget or philosophy. Fair enough. This is not a sponsored post, though again, it is wonderful to have friends to lend me gear when I ask. In fact, I can't. I choose not to purchase gear this expensive at this point in my journey. But it doesn't stop me from recognizing what I've experienced, reveling in it, and putting the resulting image on our wall, a concrete reminder of the feeling both Claudia and I had shooting that particular day. We love what we do. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. You guys continue to be just incredible, knowledgeable, inspiring, funny. I mean, you're a joy, truly. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Grab one or both of our new Hold That Thought t-shirts you wanted us to put up at our new 3BMEP Threadless.com store. 
Support our work by using our affiliate links down below in the show notes, dropping us coffee money via our PayPal link down below in the show notes, or even better than that, we invite you to become a patron of our work over at Patreon. Link down below. We've created our Patreon page because we are stoked to bring you not only gear reviews, but with our What Were You Thinking and Good World Gone Bad series, historical, educational, artistic morsels, and longer form conversations, not interviews, with world-class photographers, curators, gallery owners, keepers of the legacy, folks like Elliot Erwitt, Anya Sear, Mark Lubell, Ethelene Staley, and friends like Brian Smith, Paul Giroux, Nino Rakicevic, and more. We'd really like you to join us to deliver this kind of content regularly. Your support on Patreon will really help us ramp it up. In which case, as always, we thank you for it. That's it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time.